Revelation chapter 20. Now, as we're continuing our series, we're getting right to the end. There's only a couple chapters left. This passage is most famously known for teaching what's called the premillennium, or the, the millennium or the premillennial reign of Christ. And this is an important doctrine that is actually under attack today. The Catholics have been attacking it for years, trying to detract from the truth that it literally says a thousand years, six times right here. And they'll say, well, a thousand doesn't mean a thousand. And, you know, if you were here Sunday night, we read this in Psalm 90 where it says, for a thousand years in thy sight are as but yesterday. And with God, a day is like a thousand years. He tells us that in the book of Peter. He says, uh, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. That passage in particular is dealing with the day of the Lord. You move down two verses in 2 Peter 3 and it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's called the day of God, the day of the Lord. It's called a thousand years. So God's going to show up and he's going to show us what a true thousand year period with true godly government, what it looks like. He attempted to do this through the nation of Israel and they failed. They didn't even make it 500 years. They had catastrophic failure, many problems because humans will always ruin it. God is perfect and he's going to reset the earth in a sense and he's going to take this old earth and make it much like the Garden of Eden was. And those days are coming after the resurrection. I have a, a chart I'd like to pass out. If I can give this to some of these young men to pass it out. Thank you, sir. And this is the, the historic premillennial view. This is what uh, one of the early church fathers, Irenaeus, believed. This is what Spurgeon believed. Not that any, any of that matters anything. I'm just going to show you what the Bible says tonight. I'm not big on quoting church fathers because... No sooner than you find a guy that you think agrees with you, and then he's off in the ditch on some heresy. So, so I, th- these are our fathers. It's the Lord Jesus Christ gave us his word, and we have the apostles and the prophets and the disciples. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And let's go through this chart first of all before we go through the entire book. If you'll notice here, I broke it down into, uh, I, try, I gave you a timeline, real simple. In that last seven years, you have the three and a half years that's called the tribulation. This is referenced as 42 months that the Gentiles will tread the holy city. Uh, These are the Jews that say they're not Jews. They'll be in control. Satan, through the Antichrist, will set up his king. uh, That first seal that is the Antichrist being released. And he will begin uh, his reign on earth. It lasts three and a half years. The abomination of desolation happens at the midpoint. That's not here. But right after that, essentially, we will see the resurrection. That resurrection is referenced in Revelation. It's called the first resurrection. And for three and a half years after that, God pours his wrath out. Now, I remind you that Satan, he is the prince of the power of the, of the air. Well, he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Right. So at the coming of the Lord, that 1 Thessalonians 4, he says that we'll be caught up with him in the air, and that we'll be with the Lord forever after that. So we're going into that air, which is a heaven. We're going to be with Christ for the three and a half years that he pours out his wrath on the earth. That also is given a time. We have the 1260 days of the Antichrist. It's called times time and half a time, which is three and a half years. Daniel and Revelation give, it a, give multiple moments of giving us this last seven-year period We only see the seven years in one place. That's Daniel 9, and it doesn't actually call it seven years. But we do clearly see a bunch of three-and-a-half-year periods. And so discerning which one is the tribulation, where the Antichrist is reigning, versus which one is the wrath. And so we've dealt with that in previous sermons, but I have a simplified version there. So we're resurrected. We're in heaven until we're with the Lord in his throne until we come back down, and we'll be with him for that thousand-year reign, that earthly kingdom. Um, Then after that, Satan is loosed for a little season. We don't know how long of a season that is. He gathers the nations to go to war against God. And then there's a final judgment, the great white throne 
and then finally the new earth. Now, I've, I've broken everything down also um, with some description. The historic premillennial millennial doctrine understands that there will be a time of persecution by the Antichrist, followed by the first resurrection at the second coming of Christ, before a literal 1,000-year period of his earthly kingdom, culminating with the final resurrection and judgment. Historic premillennialism is non-dispensational, seeing unity between the church and Israel. The church has not replaced Israel, but they are joined together into one body of Christ. Salvation is freely available to everyone by faith in Jesus alone. No one can be saved by the law without Christ. And there is no secret rapture taught in the scriptures. We have that first resurrection and then we have the end of the world. There's no other resurrections other than that, according to the scriptures. Finally, the note there, historic premillennialists predate the Catholics by 300 years. What, what we're about to learn tonight was the prominent view for 300 years until we started having these guys, the influence of Origen, Augustine, and all of those that became Catholics, and they started to change the dialogue, saying, well, it's a historicist view, and what they mean is... That already happened back in the first century, and they symbolize everything, they spiritualize it, and they say none of it is literal. And there's a big problem when you do that. So historic premillennialists predate the Catholics by 300 years, the Reformed Protestants by 1,500 years, and the dispensational Zionists by 1,800 years. I should add that today the, one of the common detractors to a believing that the millennium is still to come. is called post-millennialism. Who's heard of that? A post-millennial view. Now, this was really developed and popularized in about 1750 by Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards did, he, he did commentary on one book in the Bible. It was Revelation. And in that book, he said, no, this is all past. Um, we are already past that. Jo now, Jonathan Edwards, for those that don't know, he was a Calvinist. He is what we would call a five-point Calvinist he was a pedo-baptist. He taught you had to baptize your babies for, so that they could enter into the covenant of salvation. Jonathan Edwards had a lot of doctrinal problems, but because of his zeal and his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, people started to listen to him on Revelation. So late 1700s, right before dispensationalism was created, this post-millennial view came to a surface where they said, oh, okay. So he popularized it. He took other men's writings and, and systematized it, just like John Nelson Darmy didn't totally invent it, but he systematized dispensationalism. Well, Edwards did that with the post-millennial view. And what he taught was, we make the world better. The time will come where everybody will get saved and they will keep God's law. We're going to make the world better by a sword. Everybody will be saved. And then Christ will just come down and receive his nearly perfected kingdom. This really is a b bizarre statement, and you have to ignore a lot of scriptures to believe a post-millennial view. Uh, I think that's the worst. Ah, uh, millennial is pretty bad also. There is no millennium, doesn't exist at all, or really what they mean is we're in the millennium, that when it says a thousand years, it means the period where the Catholic Church through the Pope has reigned on earth. And then Protestants came out of that, and they said, well, it's not the Catholics, it's us, the church, which is why you had guys like John Calvin that became a very tyrannical person very evil in a lot of the judgments that he did. So it's not our job to change this world by a physical sword. It's our job to change this world by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Jesus said, blessed be the peacemakers. It's not our job to bomb our enemies and hate everybody that disagrees with us. And look, I know there are a bunch of messed up religions out there. I get it. And you know what they need? the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's make sure that we do not steal them from their opportunity to hear the truth because we're too worried about how we disagree with them politically. If you'll notice on your chart then, what I did was I broke it down with color coding so you can understand what we're about to read in the chapter and where it fits and how it understands. The tribulation comes first, which is the persecution where Satan, it says, would deceive the nations. The saved were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And the world worshiped the beast, his image, received his mark in their foreheads and in their hands. Then we see the first resurrection, commonly called the rapture. That's where we're caught up. And that is for the saved. He says, I saw the souls of them, right? That is the first resurrection. Then in the yellow or the gold section, we see Satan. 
He's bound for a thousand years and cast into the bottomless pit. This is the judgment of God. This happens at the end of that three and a half years of the wrath of God. He finally takes away all their power. And in that culmination of the seventh trumpet, seventh vial, seven thunders, everything just boom, 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 boom. And God kicks them off the earth to set up his perfect kingdom. Then we have the millennial reign of Christ in blue. The saved, that's us, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years Blessed and holy is he that hath his part in the first resurrection. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we have something to look forward to. Now, after that, we see a repeat in the pattern. If you notice through the color delineation, we'll help you see that repeating pattern where there's a little season, uh, it, Gog and Magog, and that's where Satan is loosed out of his prison for a little season, it tells us, and he gathers the nations to go to battle against God. So there's this little time of rebellion there. And that's always, it's fascinating to me because people will say things like, well, seeing is believing. Therefore, anybody in the millennium has to be saved. There are famous commentators that have some bizarre statements that there will not be any lost people in the millennium. But Isaiah would clearly tell us that that's not true. There will be sinners and they will be accursed. There will be children playing with snakes, right? The wolf and the lamb and the lion and all these animals will be at peace one with another. Oh, if I could just get my dog to be at peace with our chickens. Wouldn't that be a, what a wonderful day that will be, right? <laughs> Look forward to peace on earth when Christ is in charge. And we see that Satan, for whatever reason, in God's doing, giving people an opportunity. They see God supernaturally. He rules over them with a rod of iron and yet they still have a responsibility to choose salvation in their heart. Some will, and they will be rewarded at that last resurrection. Others will not. They will reject him. And they will follow Satan when he's loosed. Now, the beast and the false prophet, we saw it in chapter 19. They are cast directly into the lake of fire already. They're down there. And, but Satan, he's going to be cast into hell, a prison, a pit for a thousand years, and then released and back onto earth. It's also important to say because there's new doctrines out there. People are saying, well, we're in the little season. We're past the millennium, and Satan has no, because you know, that would mean, think about it. If we're in the millennium now, post-millennium or amillel, amill means no, right? Asexual, no, no sexual. Amillennium, post-millennium. That would mean the devil has no power today. So that's easy to debunk. That's, a, that's real, I mean, oh, really? You're going to tell me the devil's not working, that the spirits aren't working? Come on, right? We still see sinful flesh. We don't see Christ sitting on a throne and ruling and reigning. Uh, nonetheless, people have these weird theories and the little season. We're in Satan's little season now. They'll say, oh, the millennium has passed. We missed the resurrection, and we're in the little season. I don't know where they come up with the stuff, but it's easy to debunk if they would just read the scriptures and stop listening to false prophets. Um, then you see that final judgment where the great white judgment throne. And now I just want to remind you that this is not where we are rewarded as Christians. We are rewarded as we go into the millennium to the judgment seat of Christ. We are rewarded as we go into the millennium. We're resurrected in the middle of the seven years. We go to heaven with God for three and a half years when we come down. So we're given a reward in our body, in a sense, when we get there with him. We're given a reward in a sense when we get a crown or perhaps a new name, but there's a reward to come given to us on earth. He will set us over cities. And so those rewards, we see that fruition in the millennial reign of Christ. We, we will see that then. That does not. So if somebody dies and goes to heaven tomorrow, they have not received that full reward. I would remind you that all of the Old Testament prophets looked for a heavenly city, and we'll see that one day. It's not on earth now. Many people have issues with the Middle East thinking it's the promised land, it's the holy land. Well, the promise is the millennial reign, and it's only holy when God is there. And when God's not there, it's not called the holy land. Dirt can't be holy. God is holy. That's why at the burning bush, he said, take off your shoes. This is holy ground because God was there. So it's holy land when the Lord is there, and he will be there during the millennial reign of Christ. Then finally, we see the new heaven and the new earth. So that's a summary. That's a chart. I hope that will help you. I, I'm a visual person, and I, I think we all can comprehend big concepts a little better when we have a map. And so that was the goal with this. So I hope it is a blessing for you. Now let's go into the scriptures and just go line by line through the entire passage of Revelation chapter 20. So let's start in verse number one. 
And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and had a great chain in his hand. Now, we'll see that chain is to lock up the devil. But, you know, I, I preached a sermon a little while ago called God's Key Chain. Did you know God has several different keys? Did you know that? The first one that's mentioned is actually the key of David. And this is dealing with he has the power and authority over the throne of David. And we see that mentioned in Isaiah 22. We also see it in Revelation chapter 3. So one of his first keys is the key of David. Then we also see the key of heaven. Matthew 16, where he tells us that um, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So he has given his believers, his church, the keys of heaven by faith in Jesus Christ. He says that the lawyers took away the key of knowledge in Luke chapter 11. And then we see the keys of of death and hell in Revelation 1, which it says keys plural. So there is a key for death and a key for hell. And what we see right here in Revelation 20, verse 1, is the key of the bottomless pit. And we also see that Revelation chapter 9. So God has a big old key ring. He has the authority and the access. And if you just think, what does that mean? Well, if you have a key to the building, you can come and go as you please. If you have a key to your house or your car, you can use it at your pleasure. Well, God has the keys of heaven and earth and hell, the bottomless pit and death and knowledge and wisdom. So he has all power. He has the key of David, which is showing that he is the Christ. There's only one Christ, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He has that key. Continuing in verse number two, and he laid, on, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So this is after the seven years. He actually says something almost identical. Uh, let me see, Revelation 12, verse 9. He says almost an identical thing, but that's halfway through. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the world, and he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I'm sorry, that's the beginning of the seven years. War in heaven, Michael and the angels, they kicked the devil out. The devil is not in hell today. That is not what the Bible teaches. No, sir. The devil is in heaven. He is a spirit. Heaven is the home of spirits. Earth is the home of the terrestrial, the terrain. We're made out of dirt. So there's the celestial, and there's angels up there, good and bad. And there's the Holy of Holies. God had his, has his throne, and he has his temple up there, and he has a separation. There's war up there right now. Can you imagine supernatural beings, angels fighting. And there comes a point where it spills out and God says, I'm done. Kick the devil out of heaven. He's going down to the earth. And that is the first seal. That's the beginning of the seven-year period. Now, remember, it's not all tribulation. The first half is tribulation. Then we're resurrected. Then God pours out his wrath on the Antichrist. So uh, we see that same phrase, though, the devil, Satan, that old serpent, the dragon, we see that phrase in Revelation 20 and also 12. Continuing in Revelation 20, verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Those would ask, is the bottomless pit the same thing as hell? Yes and no. I believe yes it is because we see Old Testament references and new about it be, hell being the pit. This chapter uniquely talks about the bottomless pit, the lake of fire, and hell. Now, if you have one of the New Catholic Bibles, they delete where the word hell is at, and they also delete where it says that we will stand before God. They want to change this chapter. That's what the Catholic Bibles do. So thank God we have preserved Scripture still. But I, So if you would compare this to Isaiah 14, you see that he's cast down. Um, I think Ezekiel 28 deals with it also, but they will look upon him narrowly and say, is this the man? And so what happens is there are those in hell now, and he goes down below them. I think God has a special prison in hell for him. I don't think um, where he goes is the same place that everybody else goes. He's put in chains of darkness reserved unto judgment as some angels are currently. Uh, so continue. In, so it says there at the end of verse 3 that, he must be loosed a little season. God has a plan with that little season. We'll know when we see it. But here's the good news. 
You're not going to have this old body anymore when you see all this. You will be in your new, eternal, supernatural, spiritual body as we see all of that take place. Verse number four. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's a couple great things here. Number one, we see God's throne. And we may dig into the thrones here because the throne is a big deal. Being, seeing God in his throne is something we need to look forward to. We're not going to stand there and say anything. We're probably going to bow down and weep and praise him and worship him for his mercy. Uh, but he, So they see the thrones and they that sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. You understand there are Christians that have already been beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And it's for telling us that it will happen again. Those that will not receive the mark, the devil will behead people. This is what the Bible is telling us. Notice what it says. They're beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God. Why? Because they wouldn't worship the beast or his image. They didn't receive the mark in their forehands or in their heads. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I want to share something with you called the laws of Noah. Have you guys ever heard of the laws of Noah? Well, if you didn't know it, our government says this is what our nation was founded upon. Now, wait a minute. I thought... Surely the Ten Commandments, if anything, right? I mean, we have this big debate about the Ten Commandments in schools. Well, really, Jesus brought it down to one commandment, love. Love God, love your neighbor, right? Education Day USA was first celebrated on April the 20th, 1986, and was designated by Congress in House Joint Resolution 582. The purpose of the day was to explain and teach about how the United States was founded on the seven Noahide laws. I'm going to teach you about the Noahide laws. And listen, who knows about the Sharia law? Under Sharia law, can they kill Christians? Noahide laws are the same way. And it's already been passed in our House of Representatives as an American law. The seven laws of Noah. This day also coincided with the 86th birthday of the late Rabbi Manichem Mendel Schneerson. The rabbi, as he was affectionately known, was still and is in some ways the head of the worldwide Lubavitcher movement. Chad Bad Lubavitch. Have you guys heard of that? It is a racist organization. It is liberal, left-wing, starting riots. Printing propaganda. It is a Jewish movement. It is Zionistic. They've caused a lot of problems. They've caused riots. The the Lud the, the Chad Bad, as it's commonly known, the Lubavitcher movement. Here's what it says. And we respect the Rebbe and his accomplishments in the world of Judaism and his role of teaching about the Torah and the rewards of observing mitzvahs in doing good deeds. By the way, mitzvahs or what they teach, if we do enough mitzvahs. It will balance the scale and their Messiah will come. Our Messiah has already come. Judaism today is saying if we do enough good deeds, then we can bring in the Messiah. And that's what the third temple is about. That's what the Zionist movement's about. That's why they're trying to restore the land in Israel right now to set up a Christ. But he is not the Christ. So this is what it's all about. Uh, the mitzvahs and doing good deeds. We support the Lubavitcher movement, which suggests you learn more about them. We applaud the work they do in the communities and serve around the world. They are helping large numbers of people learn about Hashem. Hashem is a word that they use for God, but it means the name. They won't even say God's name. Now, if you really, if you like loved your wife, would you say, I love you so much, I'm not even going to say your name. I'll just call you name It's kind of weird when you think about it. They serve another God. If they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father, is what 1 John 2 tells us. They don't claim Jehovah. They claim 
the universal name. They were helping large numbers of people learn about Hashem. We do, not, we do not support that Rabbi was the Moshiach or the Messiah. That was what they said back in the day. when He, he is the Messiah. He's got the laws of Noah. We're getting this instituted into law. He must be the Messiah. Nope, he didn't fulfill it. He died. <laughs> the Messiah won't die. They're looking for a conquering king in Israel to build the third temple. That's what they're looking for. So they're saying, we don't support that he was the Messiah, uh, as he did not fulfill the necessary tasks that are required. We suggest... You check the section regarding the Messianic age for further explanation of what was required to be the Messianic king. By the way, Jerusalem right now is on a countdown because they have a prophecy in the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, that whenever Jerusalem becomes the capital, that there's only a few years before they're expecting their Messiah. So they're short in time looking for their global leader to set up a third temple and reinstate the sacrifice. Nevertheless, we accept the challenge of continuing to request to teach uh, the entire world about the seven Noahide laws. Please see the section concerning... Okay. The following information is taken exactly as it appears in the public records of the United States of America. House Joint Resolution 582. 99 Congress in the United States of America, the second session begun and held at the city of Washington on Tuesday, the 21st day of January, 1986. 1986. Joint Resolution to designate April 20th 1986 as Education Day USA. This is the this is the guys. Well, it's an everybody loves education, right? Education about what? The Antichrist. Whereas Congress recognizes the historical tradition of ethical values and principles, which are the base basis of civilized society upon which our great nation was founded. Whereas these ethical values and principles have been a bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization when they were known as the seven Noahide laws. Guys, there are no seven laws of Noah in any holy scriptures. You will only find it in the Babylonian writings called the Talmud. Whereas without these ethical values and principles, the edifice of civilization stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. If we don't keep the seven laws of Noah, it's all over, right? Whereas society is profoundly concerned with the recent weakening of these principles that has resulted in crisis that beleaguer, beleaguer and threaten the fabric of civilized society. Whereas the justified preoccupation with these crises, crises must not let citizens of this nation lose sight of their responsibility to transmit these historical ethical values from our distinguished past to the generation of the future. Whereas the love of itch movement has fostered and promoted these ethical values and principles throughout the world. And whereas Rabbi Manikim Mendel Schneerson, leader of the love of itch movement, is universally respected and revered and his 84th birthday falls on April 20th, 1986. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and the House representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that April 20th, 1986, the birthday of Rabbi Manikim Mendel Schneerson, leader of the head of the World Lubavitch Movement, is designated as Education Day USA. The president is requested to issue a proclamation calling upon the United States to observe such a day with appropriate ceremonies and activities. Approved. April 22nd, 1986, by Ronald Reagan. Now, this is a serious issue, guys. Our government has already passed the law, and you say, well, what in there says they can decapitate us? How are you connecting that to Revelation 20 where it says they were beheaded? Here's the seven laws of Noah. Number one, not to worship idols. Hey, we would agree with that, but wait a minute. Who is their God? Hashem. Or uh, um, what's the female deity? Shekinah. You ever heard somebody talk about the Shekinah glory? This is a pagan deity that comes out of the Talmud and people in churches preach it like it's God's word. They have a false God. And they say if you disagree with their God, which at this time will be the Antichrist, he will rule by the seven laws of Noah all around the world. And if you disagree with him, then that's called idolatry. If you say, no, 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 you're not the Christ. Jesus was the Christ. They would say that's blasphemy 
and idolatry. I'll show you in a minute, according to their law, worthy of death. Here's the seven laws. Not to worship idols. Do not curse God. So if you say, he's the Antichrist, they'll say, you're cursing God. You should be put to death. Do not commit murder. Sounds good. Do not commit adultery or, or sexual immorality. Sounds good. But I also have to warn you about the Talmud, that it specifically, it says if, a, if, if you can have, you can molest children, and that's not called normal Adultery. It's bizarre what the Talmud teaches. It's, it's horrible. Not to steal. We can agree with that. But now in the Talmud also, it defines those that are not Jewish as cattle. Like we don't have a soul. We're called goyim. We don't have a soul. We're soulless. We're goyim. We're cattle. It's okay to kill or steal from cattle. They don't have a soul. They they're not eternal. Not to eat flesh from a living animal and to establish courts of justice. Notice number seven is to establish courts of justice this is what the Antichrist is going to operate under, and they're getting it passed all over the world. They're even getting it put into place in certain states, and this is how they're going to operate. It's called the seven laws of Noah. Do your research. Now, this is what the Talmud says. This is one of the Talmudic jurists. That's one of their rabbis. Here's what they say. How must the Noahides fulfill the commandment to establish laws and courts? They are obligated to set up judges and magistrates in every city to render judgment according to these six mitzvos, six laws for the Jews, seven for the goyim, the, the Gentiles, and to admonish the people regarding their observation. A Noahide who transgresses these seven commandments shall be executed by decapitation. That's the Talmud. It's the Talmud that teaches us that there's a Babylon, that there's a uh, Abraham's bosom in hell. It's the Talmud that teaches us that Jesus burned in hell. It's the Talmud that teaches us these, but, but, but these doctrines have made their way into Bible-believing churches, and they just repeat it as if it's true. And I'm here to warn you that the National Education Day that our government passed is a conspiracy against Christianity. It's a conspiracy against the Bible. Let's continue. Revelation 20, let's read it again in verse number 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It's, it's almost a, a non-decision a non when somebody says, you believe Jesus is the only Christ? Well, we're going to put you to death if you don't worship this new Christ. Call him God and keep the seven laws of Noah. We're going to put you to death. We're going to cut off your head. What would it take for somebody to convince you that the sun and the moon and the stars don't really exist? That there, there is no such thing as trees. <laughs> so you've lost your mind. Once you understand in the Holy Spirit, once you understand the power of the Scriptures, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit moves in. There's no going back. Now your eyes are open. You've been enlightened into spiritual things. You can't, I can't pull out a sheet of paper necessarily and prove it to you. It's something that I know in my spirit and my true being, who, my inner essence, who I am. And when somebody says, I'm going to kill you if you don't recant, just like those, that kid at the, the school shooter going around looking for Christians. Recant, Jesus. Shoot me. I can't do that. God forbid. He does tell us in Hebrews 11 that those received a better resurrection. You know, there's a great reward for those that serve God here and lay down their life here. There really is. I pray that we never see that. I mean, maybe we're in this time. Maybe not. Either way, we should just kind of lay down our life and live for the Lord anyway. It's our reasonable service. It's our duty. He purchased us, our spirit, our soul, and our body. He owns it all. Let's give it to Him every day. I'll pass over the section dealing with the thrones in a sense. I was going to show you a few different things about the thrones and the timing, but let's just stay on course here in Revelation 20, verse number 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So this first resurrection, it comes, and then God pours out His wrath. There's the thousand years, 
and then there will be a final one. So notice how he calls it here. He says, the first resurrection begins before the thousand years. So you have that on your chart. This comes from, this is paired perfectly with 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about Christ, the first fruits, right? Jesus Christ was resurrected first. In fact, I reference it here, 1 Corinthians 15. Christ, the first fruits, then they which are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to the Father. So after the thousand year kingdom, he's going to deliver that kingdom up to the Father. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15. So we look forward to that first resurrection. It's the only resurrection. There's not a secret resurrection seven years before it. The timing is important to understand. Uh, we go through tribulation. We're resurrected at the first resurrection. God pours out his wrath for three and a half years. Then we come back to the earth in a celestial body. It's interesting because he, we see he's going to say, uh, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. But then he also he says that first resurrection is before the thousand years. This will debunk what's called the pre-tribulation rapture, post-millennial view that the, the, the millennium is past, the amillennial view. Millennium doesn't mean millennium. It's just a figure, to, figure of speech and it's a great period of time that no one knows. It really debunks all of those things because after the thousand years, it's God's judgment. Like it's, he, he wraps it all up. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part on the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You know, we'll reign with him a thousand years. We'll be priests of God. We'll also be kings. We'll also be a judge, blessed and holy. And you know, that second death will have no power. You're either born twice, you either get born physically and then born again spiritually, or you die twice, you die and go to hell, and then death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So everybody does one or the other. We're either born twice or you die twice. Go to Revelation chapter one. I just want to touch on this about those that will reign with Christ for a thousand years. As you're turning there, let me read 1 Corinthians 6. He says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? We have a position in the millennium. He says, And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life. Those angels that are cast out, at, right, at the beginning of the seven years, they persecute humans for three and a half years, were resurrected, God pours out his wrath, his final act, the armies of God comes with him, and we execute judgment. We actually judge angels. We'll judge the earth. You're in Revelation chapter one. Look at verse number six. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. King, priest, We'll serve him forever. Go to Revelation 5. Go to Revelation 5. As you're going there, in Revelation 2 it says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him shall I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Revelation 3, he says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I am also overcome and set down with my Father in his throne. Now you're in Revelation 5. Look at verse 10. And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. There are people that say we won't reign on the earth. The Bible, there's a plethora of verses. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Go back. Let me read Matthew 8, the words of Jesus Christ. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said the children of the kingdom was supposed to be his people. He came unto his own, but his, they received him not. And he says there will be many that claim Israel that will be cast into hell because they rejected Christ. But there will be many from other nations that come and literally sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know what my DNA holds. I would guess we all have a little bit of the 12 tribes somewhere as We've, I mean, I really do. I think we've all gotten to that point. There is no such thing as a pure blood. There isn't. So it's not about our blood. It never was about the blood. It was about our faith in Christ. Jacob believed the Son of God. 
And he was called after God's name. If my people, which are called by my name, you know the verse. In that same passage, he says, you're the children of Israel. Israel was a name for God. It was a name for Jesus, just as Emmanuel, just as today. Christian, I'm called by God's name. We're called after him. You're back in Revelation chapter 20. Look at verse number 7. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. To me, this is crazy. This is the same region, Gog and Magog, the same reason, region that a thousand years earlier we see it in Ezekiel foretelling that before the millennial reign, after the resurrection, there's a couple battles there in what we would call the Russian, Ukraine, in that area. You can tie it to Germany, Gog, Magog, in that area. And so the Bible foretold it. It seems that there's going to be major battles there before the millennium. And then here, once Satan is loosed, it's like that same region. Those are different events in uh, it's Ezekiel 38 and 39 mention it. Ezekiel 40 through 48 is all about the millennium. This is after the millennium, the little season Satan's loosed. These people have lived in a perfect world for a thousand years. Now we can assume that they would all receive Christ. They're still human flesh. They're still sinful in nature. And they're punished by God much quicker. Sinners, it's set in their heart to do evil because they feel that God's hand is shortened, that he's not going to judge them. How many times have you seen somebody do something horrible and you say, oh, if God would just judge them? Be careful because how many times have we done something wrong where if God had judged us immediately, we'd be dead, right? We'd be, we'd be in big trouble. And so we're thankful for his mercy and his long suffering and his grace. And going into the millennium, it's going to be totally different. He's going to have us as armies supernaturally over sitting over these cities and ruling and reigning with him. Verse 9. And they went on, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The beloved city is New Jerusalem. It's not the old Jerusalem. If you remember the old Jerusalem or end times earthly Jerusalem is where the Antichrist will reign from. That city is progressively destroyed in God's judgments. The sixth judgment, one-tenth of it's destroyed. Seventh judgment, one-third of it's destroyed. And in that final last bit when he shows up, he destroys the whole thing. He steps down. He splits it open. The waters of life begin to flow out. A mountain comes down, and the new Jerusalem comes down. And let me just remind you real quick, the promised land has never been the dirt that's there now. What people are arguing about in Palestine, that has never been what it's about. That's the area, yes. Listen to this in Hebrews 11, verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham said, I'm looking for a supernatural city. Well, that's new Jerusalem. It didn't exist back then. It's in heaven. When he died, he went up there. He's in it. And the bride will come down to earth one day. Hebrews eleven sixteen. 16. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hebrews 12, verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. That'll be the, I mean, and a great multitude which no man can number. We see that in Revelation chapter 7. You can't count how many people are in heaven. Hebrews 12, he continues, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just man made perfect. Our spirit will be made perfect when we get there. We're not perfect down here. We look for heavenly Jerusalem. It's in heaven right now. We're not looking for earthly Jerusalem. People are confused about that. Hebrews 13, verse 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. This was written while Jerusalem existed. Before it was destroyed in 70 AD. He said, we're not looking for that city. We're looking for this city. We're looking for a spiritual city. We're looking for a heavenly country, a heavenly city. 
He kept trying to explain that to them in Hebrews was to help them understand the Old Testament, those that were locked up in the Pharisees' doctrine. The Pharisees, their oral tradition was codified 600 years later. It's called the Talmud. What the Pharisees taught, if you look it up, who, who uses the Talmud? Well, that's if you look up rabbinical Judaism today, they claim to be the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And they claim that they're persecuted by Christians, but really it's the opposite way. They, they were persecuting Christians. They put Jesus to death. Finally, Revelation 20, verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Forever and ever. Revelation 14 said the same thing, that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night. When people take the mark of the beast, when they say, this is our Christ, take his mark in your hand, bind it upon your hand, and bind it upon the frontlets of your eyes. Bind his mark upon you. Anybody that's of Israel will follow the, the Antichrist, and they will seal their eternal fate. Once you've taken the mark of the beast, there's no going back. They will burn forever and ever. They have no rest, day nor night. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Guys, when you get at the end of your chart here and you see the thousand years, the great white throne, when he shows up for that final resurrection and judgment before we go into the new earth, do you know why we need a new earth? Because this one melts. Look at the verbiage again, what he says there in verse 11. Revelation 20, 11. He says, And I saw the great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. In 2 Peter 3, he says, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. You know what's going to happen? Everything that he created except souls are going to melt. It's going to disappear. He's going to scorch it all. This intangible, this matter that he created, the wood, the stone, the dirt, the stars, it's all going to disappear. And all we're going to see are the souls that are brought up from hell and those that are in New Jerusalem. Heaven and earth fled away. He even destroys his old heaven. If you remember in, the, in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The place of angels where he would build a throne and the earth. Heaven's not eternal. He's going to destroy that heaven where there's war right now and this earth where there's war right now. He's going to clean them both up. He's going to rule and reign. He's going to give them another chance. They're going to fail. Then he's going to come back and judge it all, bring everybody out of hell, judge them, cast them into the lake of fire. Those that are in the new Jerusalem, in that holy city, he will reward those that died during the millennium or lived during the millennium that believed either way. And they'll take all of us into a new heaven and a new earth and the Bible doesn't tell us anything about what it's like, but now that we are a fourth dimensional, fifth dimensional, resurrected being that's celestial and terrestrial, we can walk through walls, I believe, like Jesus and fly, and he's going to make an earth fitting for our new bodies. And it will probably be a lot like the Garden of Eden. It's kind of exciting when you think about it all. It's all going to melt. It's going to flee away. Verse 12, And I saw the dead small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You know what happens? There's two things they're judged by. The Bible and the book of life. If you're saved, your name is in the book of life, and it cannot be erased. And so everybody will stand before him. Your name's not in the book of life. You're condemned. Well, what's your punishment? Well, let's look at the laws that you've broken. You said no one can judge me. Only God can judge me. Don't judge me. I don't believe in that. Now's your time. You'll be judged by the holy word of God. And look what he says in verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they judged every man according to their works. 
Aren't you glad that we won't be judged according to our works? We are judged according to our faith in Jesus Christ. I trust he paid, he promised, he delivered. It was a gift. I didn't have to work for it, but now that I am saved, obviously I should work for it. He's created me to work for him and do things for him and tell others. But salvation has never been by works. Those that go to the second death, it's because they're trusting in their works. So they'll be judged by their works. Well, I, I don't know, I'm pretty good. I kind of tipped the scale a little bit. We're all found guilty. We all fall short. I thank God that we're not judged by our works. Otherwise, we'll end up in hell. Verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There it is, the book of life. Now, I want to I define this for you. We're done with Revelation 20, but go to, go to Revelation 3. Go to Revelation 3. I want you to see this. He says, if you're not found in the book of life, you're going to hell. You're going to the lake of fire. When you get to Revelation 3, look at verse number 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So you can underline or highlight the middle of that verse where he says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. If your name is in the book of life, it's always in the book of life. It cannot be taken out of the book of life. Now, I had a Pentecostal one time, and he literally, no, you got to do good works. You got to repent of your sin, and you got to speak in tongues, and you got to live a good life, and you got to try to keep the Ten Commandments. He's trying to tell me he has to work his way to heaven. Oh, can you name the Ten Commandments? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. So how are you going to keep them if you can't even name them, right? He's tr this guy was trusting in his works to be saved, and he said, no, once you're in the book of life, you can be blotted out. I took him to this verse. It says you cannot be blotted out. You know what he said? Well, it says you have to overcome. That means good works. Go to 1 John 5. Go to 1 John 5. Let me prove to you you're not saved by good works. Let me prove to you you cannot keep salvation by good works. Let me prove to you that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ, his promise, and what he's given us, the gift of God, which is eternal life. 1 John 5, look at verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? Great question. There it is. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. How cool is that? In fact, back up one verse. Look at verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. There it is. Born again. You're born twice or you died twice. We're born again by believing in Christ. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That's why we sing that song, Faith is the Victory. Do you believe that? Do you believe that faith is what gets you out of here? It's because we're still found sinners even to this moment. The thought of foolishness is sin. I hope you didn't think anything silly tonight because otherwise you're condemned again. Oh, thank God he paid for it all. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is? the Son of God. Isn't that beautiful? And when you connect that with Revelation 3, where he literally says that your name will not be blotted out. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Revelation 20, 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We serve an awesome God. And he knows that we live in sinful flesh. He gave it to us and he gave us free will. So no one could say, I was forced to believe. I was forced to do good or bad. No one can say that. We're drawn away of our own lust, aren't we? And I thank God for his mercy. I thank God for salvation. It's a gift from him. All you have to do is believe. Do you have the victory through faith? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. I just ask that you would use these verses to empower us and strengthen us. Lord, help us to be bold and speak up for you. We know that the time is coming, and Lord, it may even be near. We don't know. But either way, help us to just live every day for you and not be afraid and to not be ashamed. Lord, I ask that you would uh, just bless our event this weekend as we're going out to the flea market to preach the gospel. I ask that you would give us the ability to find some people that want to be saved and help us to teach them about you. 
Lord, we love you, and please keep us safe as we depart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.